go ahead and hit record. Um, all right, Emily Shaw, what would you like to discuss with us today? Yeah. Okay. My mouse got frozen on the other screen. I'm sorry. I was struggle bus today. What Rebecca and I were talking about before y'all hopped on was what an absolute struggle bus I am. Um, so last time we talked about, well, we talked about closing and then time before that we did a little bit of disc. Um, so I thought it was time to introduce some other psychological principles behind selling. Oh, we did decision-making last time too. Some other I'm just bringing in more psychology into the sales. So this one is, um, I think that Rebecca, you shared that this was predominantly about ego states. Yes. Yep. Well, let me find you over here. My mouse is stuck on the wrong screen again. So I can't get to you guys and pull you over. So I can see your lovely faces. Okay. So did y'all take um, psych 101 for your easy a in college. Yes. Great. So you great. Then you're prepped for this class. Uh, so you remember id ego and super ego. You don't really have to memorize anything else or remember anything else about it. Um, because I'm going to take it out of that context and put it into a more digestible context, but show you how it shows up in your transactions with other human beings. So you'll see words in here, like prospect, um, or client or whatever, just replace it with human. Uh, because as, as this class is, we're all selling something, just replace your word with who it is that you're having a transaction with. And I don't mean dollars transaction. I mean, a me to you conversation transaction is happening between the two of us. That's what we're going to focus on. So we're going to look at the ways that, um, the ego, ego, super ego presents itself and some problems that that can cause some of which we are very uh, familiar with already. So tell me about when you experience someone being difficult. Um, so what makes a difficult prospect is the question on the screen, but what makes a difficult person for you to engage with? Maybe you're trying to get them to change a pattern of behavior. Maybe you're trying to get them to adopt a new idea. Maybe you're just having a conversation with your kids and you're like, right? Um, that's me on a every other day basis at this point, but what makes, what makes someone difficult in a conversation when you experience them as being difficult? What are those characteristics? Argumentative. Yep. Um, disengaged. Mm -hmm. I was going to say not really, not really listening to, to me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, I feel like most of the things I'm thinking about kind of fit under those two categories. Okay. I've got some other examples that we can talk through too. Um, when your needs and their needs don't coincide, right? And so that could be, that could show up as disengagement or not listening. Um, that could show up as what are you talking about? All right. Confusion. Um, it's a, it's a misalignment there. And I think oftentimes from a selling perspective, salespeople, and even if you're not in a sales role, you won't find this challenging to picture salespeople are like the client, right? They don't even know that they need this. They can't even see that they need blah, 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 blah. It's always like, the client was misaligned uh, on their needs to what it should have been in that conversation. And I'm constantly saying to salespeople, hey, whose objective did you have in mind when you went into this conversation? Who were you looking to serve? Yourself or that person? I'm confused as to why you're so upset if you showed up to serve that person and they were talking about something else, you should have pivoted to be able to serve them in that moment, as opposed to trying to force your agenda and then blaming them for not coming along. So it could be either way, right? It could be that uh, their need is not aligned. It could be that we're focusing on the wrong thing and, and not the need that's actually going to move the conversation forward uh, or, or build that rapport. Um, when we are unclear on expectations, Sometimes it's just difficult when we show up to a meeting with somebody else and we had one thing in mind and they had another thing in mind. <laughs> um, I love, we've all read it, I'm sure multiple times, but 
Brene is what it's done look like and the story that she tells about her team continually missing the mark when they're traveling. Like I laugh out loud uh, during that portion and dare to lead all the time. I think it was dare to lead. I don't know. They're all sort of meshed together in my brain now um, when she's telling that story about um, the, the packets and where they needed to be. And it was taken very literally. She's like, who thinks like that? <laughs> um, so that can create difficulty in conversation. Um, and this is a nice PC, uh, professional training way of me saying some people are real assholes, right? <laughs> it's difficult to deal with you whether you're in a prospecting scenario, um, HR meeting or a, a neighbor, right? If you're just always an asshole, that's difficult. Uh, but you know, you could also say as difficulty being socially acceptable with their behavior is an, is a nice way to say that. So how do we work through these things? Oh, oh sorry, um, stressed or unwell. If Denise, I don't think that you were on our DISC session a few months ago, but are you familiar with DISC? Like very familiar with DISC? Okay. So you know every um, quadrant reaction under stress. You're familiar with those hacks? Yes. Okay, great. So when a high D is stressed, they lack empathy, right? Well, that's pretty difficult to deal with. When a high eye is stressed, they're completely unorganized and all over the place. That's difficult to deal with. with that, when a high S uh, is stressed, this is the one that's most challenging for me. They become very victim and martyr -y. Ooh, that's a, that's like a trigger for me <laughs> to be like, get your shit together. <laughs> um, and when a high C is stressed, they're very, very critical of everything and everyone around them and everything is negative. Um, and that's, that's a challenge as well. So being cognizant of someone's behavioral style and, you know, adding the fact that they're, that they're stressed out and then mining our own ego state during that conversation is a lot to process. And if we're not intentionally going into it or know, okay, this is where I pay attention to my ego state. This is where I, so I'm going to give you some hacks today on how to stay out of the danger zone, because this can be triggering for everybody, uh, depending on what you respond to or don't respond to well. Okay. So parent, adult, child is an ego, super ego. Um, so when we think of parents. Um, we've got a couple different styles of parenting that we're looking at from a parent ego state. So we've got critical parent, nurturing parent. Um, I'm going to go over the details with those. I'm just giving you the high level overview really quickly. Adult is your logical, factual, is, is not uh, ego state. And child you look at how many children we have running around in there. I tell people all the time, we are just little kids walking around in big people meat suits because the number of children in those ego states outweighs all the other ones combined. <laughs> so, um, and, and any, any human being that you're dealing with is predominantly hardwired like a child. We just present differently, uh, ourselves included. So, um, being able to pick up on when these things are happening and why they're happening is going to be very helpful. So let's look at what these things mean. So nurturing parent, uh, I'm going to go off script a little bit here because I think this slide's kind of hokey, but, um, when you picture your parents having been nurturing in scenarios, what did that sound like? What do you recall? Reassuring. Tell me. I love that you assume that mine were, but I know. <laughs> Um, reassurance. Reassuring. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm. Let me rephrase this. When you nurture your own children, what does it sound like? <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> oh. Are you okay? How supportive, loving. Mm -hmm. Attic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry, Becky. I was just going to say empathetic. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. trying to listen and understand them instead of like suck it up, buttercup. Because sometimes I want to say that too, but I usually try to not do that. <laughs> yes. You're reverse engineering your own childhood, is what I'm hearing. Yes. <laughs> you'll you'll yeah. start saying those things when they're like 12. 
a little bit older. You're not there yet. I don't know. Mine are nine and 12 when I try so hard to stay out of the critical parent tone. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a minute, it really just doesn't get you anywhere. Um, so you're protecting them, you're helping them, you're supporting them, you're empathizing with them, you're encouraging them. Um, that behavior, the behavior is stupid at the bottom. I don't know who made this slide. I don't make this slide. It's dumb, but the behavior really is that you're, you're softening a lot of what your natural instincts may be to do, depending upon how you were raised. I mean, I know I, I, Rebecca smiled and I was like, I know because I get it. I had three completely critical parents. I did not have a single nurturing parent in my upbringing. Uh, so I'm guessing this slide will be a lot easier for us to articulate. What does a critical parent sound like? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Give me some examples of what your you can all have to do what's on the slide, but your your critical parent uh, experiences. What do those sound like? Take it off. Mine. I thought I don't know why I have so many sports references running through my head. That was just my upbringing. Yeah. So from like coaches and parents, like, yep, shake it off, keep moving. Yep. That ain't gonna get you nowhere. So. Yep. You're not special. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, okay. I'm not going to make this therapy about me, but for a minute I am. You know, what's interesting is I don't remember either one of those. I remember just being one of them because I was raised with all adults. So I don't ever remember being like parented. Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? I mean, it was I don't know, weird. Like nobody was checking in on shit. I mean, I, I don't even. I guess I had a curfew, but I don't even remember that. Like, anywho. Yeah, yeah. I'll do my own therapy later about it. Um, that's interesting you said that though, because I was having a hard time too, because like, so my dad passed away when I was 14. So like my high school years, I don't remember anyone ever telling me what to do. I think I was just on my own. But when I was younger, I feel like they were pretty nurturing, like pretty supportive, like mm -hmm. me into things. I mean, I remember doing family vacations and like, going out to breakfast with my dad by myself. Like, so I have good nurturing, like memories, but then I, but then like, as I got older, I don't have any, like, I felt like I was like, all right, you got it. <laughs> go yeah. on. Yeah. Taught you, we taught you what you needed to know before you were 10. Right. And Godspeed, I think, on, yeah. Godspeed on your journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You've got all the tools you need. To figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, and you know, you could think of, it doesn't have to be parents. When you think about these examples, it could be, who's the most nurturing person, you know, right. Uh, who's the most critical person that, you know, or who comes to mind when you think of critical people, they're the same. Um, but critical parent from an ego state is necessary. So nurturing parent keeps you going, right. Uh, you tell yourself it's going to be okay. You tell yourself you're strong. You've got this. I believe in you, those moments where you're jamming a T-Swift with all the windows down in your car, right? And you're like, I'm fucking badass. I'm great. I, way to go, me. <laughs> you, got, you have that in your mind to keep going. You also have a critical parent in there that's like, hey, don't walk out into the middle of the street when there's cars going across, right? Don't, there are hard and fast rules that you do have to obey to be accepted socially into your circles of people, but also to not die. So there, there are some essentials when it comes to critical parenting. It's just like with disc gifts and strengths overdone become weaknesses. So when people start to lean into one of these things and overdo them, it becomes a weakness that we then associate with, well, I had three critical parents. I was never good enough. I was never doing well enough. Even if I did something great, the feedback was, well, but did you, but did you really do everything you possibly could have, right? Did you die trying? Well, then it's probably not hard enough. Um, constantly. Um, and, and very, self-righteous people, right? Well, when I was uphill both ways in the snow and you have it so easy, what? Because my mom beat me into submission. These weird like narratives on, on why my life was so great because I didn't get beaten on a daily basis. Yay. Um, so <laughs> that's overdone. <laughs> um, so just keep these in mind as we, as we move forward to transactions between everyone. So adult 
um, is just your lack of emotion. It's just fact seeking. It's actually the go between in your own mental state, your own ego state between your child and your parent. So your child is anything, any desire you want, any need you want that comes from your child ego state. If you think about it, right? Who are the neediest people you know in your life? Children. Who are the people that want the most things in their life immediately? Children. That's that's pretty easy to remember from an ego standpoint. So you have that. You It didn't go away because you got taller. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> but you also have the parent stuff in your brain that's going, but don't get taken advantage of. Right. Um, I, I'm skeptical that this is actually going to work out because I've burn, I've been burned in the past. All of those things are, are the parent. Now the adult is the go-between between each of them. So the adult says, okay, let's look at the facts. Is this something you actually need? What will this do for you if you get this thing that you want? It appeals to the parent. Can you handle this amount of risk? Right. Um, it, so it, it, it's the go between between parent and child that, that really is making the decision. Just keep all those things in, in mind for when we talk about transactions. Okay, so now we're going to break down the kids that you got in your ego state. Natural child. When you think of natural child, what kind of characteristics do just kids in general have at their very basic level? Emotional, spontaneous. I was going to say um, curious. curious. Very. Yeah. Um, I want it yeah. now. Black and white. But you mm -hmm. said we were going to the yeah. movies and now we're not going to the movies because you lied. <laughs> yes. yes. Yep. I'm yep. sorry there was a major car accident that we can't get to the movies physically now. But yes, I lied to you about going to the movies. Yep. Right. Feel That's your adult <laughs> coming in and saying, these are the facts. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So, and, and, Yes, emotional. All of the children in the uh, psyche are emotional. Um, but this one in particular, challenging for this one to take serious, to take anything seriously. So if you know someone in, in life that's very spontaneous, that doesn't take a lot of things seriously, kind of flies by the seat of their pants, is a little bit of an emotional roller coaster, they're living out of their natural child ego state a lot. Now, conversely, if you know someone who struggles to be curious, can't break out of their monotonous routine, everything is a little too dry and black and white, they've tempered that ego state down quite a bit at some point along the way because they were probably burned using it or, or something. Um, adaptive child. Uh, this is the portion of uh, the psyche where I think about um, when I use the adaptive child example, it's what do your kids do when you ask them to clean their room? What do they do after they clean their room? What's the first thing they do after they clean their room? After they clean it? Mm -hmm. It's clean. What's the first thing they do? One would show me and the other one would purposely not. Because <laughs> you didn't do it. Right. Got it. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. she didn't do it as well as I probably would. Right. Uh, how do I know which one that would be? Uh, most kids are. OK, my kids are like, I clean my room. You want to come see it? <laughs> so I, the only reason I struggled to answer that is because I'm still struggling to, to figure out how to teach my kids to clean up after themselves. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> So I, I mean, I have a five-year-old and a four-year-old. So like we are really struggling working on this right now. And so uh, they're capable. It's just a big struggle. As soon as it becomes normal that you'll overcome that hurdle. And this yeah. thing is like, I did it. Now you want to come check it. And then, yeah. you're and I could see my girls doing that. Yeah. Right. And you'll have to like, if you're like me, you'll have to like, bite your fingers and be like, don't say it. Don't say it. Because it. it's like, I could have organized everything in here so much better. What are you, what are you children? Like, <laughs> so being okay with, with the way that they do that, but, or so Becky five, when I bring something home from school, right. It's the same yes. thing. Like, look yes. at this offering I have made to you parent God. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. That, that is a huge huge, huge thing right now is to show me everything they do all day, every day, you know? Yep. So that is the adaptive child that is 
please don't leave me. Please love me. Please help me. Please show me my, I was just on a record day. Uh, my nine-year-old was like, I have something to tell you. And I thought it was going to be this grave thing. Cause she's told me some like doozies lately. And she was like, I don't, um, I don't actually like everything that you like, but I've been really afraid to tell you that for the past, whatever, nine years, because I thought you would like me less. Right. And, um, and my brain goes adaptive child. Right. Don't leave me. I'm like you. I want to be just like you when I grow up. That's a, I want to be bonded to you. Right. And now she's entering nine and realizing a little later than some kids that there is some separation between the two of us (laughs) (laughs) and that's okay. But she still has that ego state where she is like tentative to tell me because she still wants that safety and security. So she's still dependent upon how I feel. Uh, she's still fearful about my reaction. She's cautious about things. And this when overdone in adults looks like people pleasing, mm. right? If we lead from our adaptive child, it's our friends who are completely stretched thin, overwhelmed, can't say no, can't deal with conflict because they want to be left, not left. They want to be loved. They want to, they want people around them. They don't, all of that stuff, they're leading from their adaptive child. Here's my friend, (laughs) my main ego state, (laughs) rebellious child. Um, And I say that laughing only because I'm in so much pain. Um, (laughs) But it's, it's within all of us. Right? It's just when you lead from it, sometimes it can it can cause some issues. And and I don't need to ask for examples of this. This is uh, apparent for us all the time. But it's interesting that their feelings are frustration, anger. I would say fear as opposed to rebellion. In some instances, is is why they rebel. And so it might look like tantrums, pouting, sulking. But interestingly, so I'm going to tell you about your first transaction. Um, and I wish that I had my whiteboard iPad thing pulled up, but since we're keeping it low key today, anyway, I'll do a handy dandy drawing for you. Tell me if you can see it on my paper. Can you see these letters? PAC. Okay. If I'm coming from my critical parent standpoint and I'm like, what's wrong with you? Why would you do it that way? Or even the subtle phrase, you should do it this way. This transaction pings someone's childlike ego state, simply the way that I phrased it. And the number one childlike state that is ignited when I use critical parent is rebellious child. Just think about even when someone's like, oh my gosh, you should watch this show. You're going to love it. What's your internal reaction? Initial internal reaction. I think should, should I? Denisa, what do you think when someone's like, uh, oh my God, you're going to watch show. Why? <laughs> hmm Yeah. Yeah. Why? Uh-huh. Yeah. I am like, don't tell me what to fucking watch. I'll watch what I want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like rebellious child is up here all the time. Um, but it is the, it's the natural ego state for all of us when we experience critical parent and critical parent can be really sneaky. It's not like you're trying to actually criticize your friend. You're just making a suggestion and saying you should, and they're excited and, and they think that you're going to really love it. Who would think that that would be critical parent, but even that resistance piece that Denise talked about, about why prove it, right? That's still, that's still a rebellious child. <laughs> There's no other ego state that that represents more. Yep. Um, and then little professor, oh, I have a little professor in my house and I love her so much, but I cannot wait until we're not in the little professor stage anymore. Y'all. <laughs> <laughs> A little professor is the person in your life that says, you say something, and then that person goes, actually, right? Um, Let me tell you how you're wrong. Or uh, I've got, she can sometimes be a bad word police. So I have colorful language. You've already probably noticed. And my nine-year-old will say, mama, I'm like, I'm sorry, excuse me. (laughs) Who the fuck are you? (laughs) (laughs) 
I don't say that. That's what my brain said. <laughs> um, because they tend to be, um, they like rules, but they also really like being right and keeping everyone in their place, right? They like to have the last word. They're very smart. They're also very manipulative, um, but not because they're evil or design flaw, but because it works and they get what they want and it's easy to do. And when you're a child, that's all you really care about, right? You don't have the, the all of the life experience on caring about others yet, right? You've got it on, on some macro level, but but actually trying to institute it. Nah, I'm, I'm out for me, right? I'm, I'm kid. Uh, who, nobody else in this world matters right now, except for me. So that leads to professor behavior about it. But you know, adults that are little professors, mm-hmm. what are some of those characteristics present like? People who lead from little professor, what are, what are some of those, what are some other characteristics that you, or how do you experience them? I feel like I, I see this and maybe I'm wrong, but maybe this comes out a little bit. Um, and maybe some people have had too much coaching on it, but it'll come out like, but if you did it this way, I could like, they try to make it sound right, but really like, it's going to be better, but really they just want it done their way. Mm-hmm, exactly. I get, I get where you're coming from here, but like, you're not even letting me do what I've even propose at all. This is completely different. You're just trying to say it nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Or sometimes it's, it feels a little bit like, um, leading the witness, like asking you questions that trap you that, you know, you can't get out of, right. Like I will hear people from a sales perspective. It's like, well, is saving more money important to you. And I'm like, don't <laughs> you now, what are they supposed to say? Right? No, I set it on fire on a daily basis. <laughs> no, that's not fair. That's not a fair question, but you're trying to force me into this place where you want me to be, to get the answer that you want. That's mm-hmm. a little professor. Yeah. So now we look at transactions. So when we have a transaction like this, so we'll say, um, parent to adult, or, or I'm sorry, parent to child. So one of us started in the parent state uh, and and talked to the other one, not like a child, but to the other's childlike ego state. So we can make it nurturing parent to an adaptive child. We can make it critical parent to a rebellious child, whatever. It, you could ask somebody a question and, and their natural curiosity may spark. Everything is fine as long as they respond to you in a parallel way. So when I, when I'm in a sales call or when I'm trying to get someone to have a light bulb turn on or, or facilitate change or, or whatever in a conversation, I come from my nurturing parent because just like critical parent triggers rebellious child immediately, nurturing parent triggers adaptive child, that child that wants to please, wants to answer the question. The one that's like, I, did I get it right? Right. When I, when I answer it, mm-hmm. am I smart? Am I good? Am I still accepted by you? Um, no, it doesn't come across like that. Everyone's still presenting as adults, but that's the, that's the easiest place for their ego to go. When we get into a problem is when um, maybe this is the most common one, right? We come from critical parent to rebellious child and we, we criticize someone or make them feel criticized in some way. Um, and they come back from their critical parent and re-criticize us. Now we have a problem because we have a crossed transaction. So anytime your transactions are creating an intersection, you're going to have conflict that you then have to reroute and get back into a parallel conversation. Doesn't mean the conversation will be over if it crosses. You may have to cross to get back into that parent state to get yourself out of child state because you don't want to just be responding out of really any child state in a conversation where you want someone to do something. So the rule is when selling or facilitating change, you guys get it. Can I just say selling? You guys know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. Uh, 70% of that conversation should come from your nurturing parent and 30% should come from your adult. You leave your kid in the car you crack the window a little bit, but you can't bring them to those conversations. It's just completely unproductive. And think about the triggers that send you on a tailspin. So some of those are um, refusing to make a decision. 
right? Or stalling on making a decision. I talk to a lot of people and I ask them, what's, what does it ignite within you when someone doesn't make a decision you know that they should make? How do you all feel? Um, first, I feel indignant because what are you, stupid? Like, how do you not see that? And then I immediately go, okay. well, I can't care about this more than you do. So I'm moving on. Good. Adult, right? Critical parent adult. Um, but first initial reaction, critical parent, normal. Um, or sometimes I hear people like, I just want to shake them. <laughs> That's a rebellious child, right? <laughs> Anytime you want to get physically aggressive with someone, I'm going to put in rebellious child camp. Sure. Um, and so we don't necessarily realize it's happening. It's just, I'm right and you're wrong, right? No, it's just that you're ego state has been triggered and you need to be aware that you are in an unproductive ego state. And how do I get back to nurturing parents? So in that context, if someone is struggling to make a decision, I, if I put my nurturing parent hat on and I picture them like my kid, I would say, help me understand what's causing friction for you in making this decision. Well, I've got this thing to think about and this thing to think about, and then there's money and then there's all these people. And I say, yeah, that that's a lot. Would it be helpful if you and I worked through a list of criteria you're going to use as to whether or not you do make this decision? And they're like, oh yeah. Remember when your like parents told you to make a pros and cons list when you couldn't <laughs> decide you're basically stepping in and helping this person from a parental state create that list so that they know how to move forward. But a lot of times people get stuck in the, well, you're stupid, so bye. <laughs> Instead of thinking, okay, how would I help this person if this were my kid or a child? Um, can, I ask a, can I ask a question? Because one oh. thing I thought of instantly that happens a lot to me since I'm in marketing and not technically, I know we're all selling something, but like I deal, like my internal clients are all the salespeople, all mm -hmm. the producers. And we have a couple, there always are, right? That are very much like, let, let me just give an example. Like most of their emails will start with, we should be doing this. We, I'm like, oh, we? So that like triggers rebellious <laughs> me right away. I get so pissed off. I mean, but I never respond pissed. I mean, I guess maybe sometimes I'm snarky probably yeah. with my response. Mm -hmm. um, but like that drives me crazy. And I feel like they have no self-awareness on that. It's the little professor coming out, yeah. right? It's the, yeah. I have a great idea for you, but I'm going to pose it as if it's like a group thing. And like, we're all in this together. That's exactly, I guess what I talked about earlier. So that must just be my thing that drives me crazy is when <laughs> people make it seem like it's a group effort, but really they're just telling you what That's to manipulative. do. Yeah, yeah. It's manipulative. Yeah. Manipulative. Everybody crazy for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so my grandfather what? used to say, we, you got a mouse in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. My stepdad says the same thing. Yeah. So it's interesting because I've eradicated you from my language predominantly, I think, um, yeah, or I've tried over the last seven years since I've been uh, deep in this content and I've replaced it with we, but I asked for permission in conjunction with we. So I don't say we should, I say, would it be possible if we did this, right? What are your thoughts on that? So it's completely different when you come from a place of nurturing. It's how I ask my kids too. I, I, I asked my kid, um, you know, she's been having a lot of behavioral issues lately. And I told her, I had a very vulnerable conversation with her. And I said, I think part of the problem for you right now might be that I'm stepping in and I'm helping a little too much. I think I'm coaching you through everything and not letting you sit with the suck. I think I'm rescuing you from the suck. Do you think that's possible? And she's like, I don't, yeah, I guess maybe. And we're having this conversation when she's not emotional. And I said, okay, how do you feel about doing an experiment with me? Could we explore you sitting with those emotions and feelings? I will not leave you. I will be in the same room as you, but instead of me talking it through, you just process that on your own and maybe come up with your own hacks and your own ways of dealing with it. So you don't have to rely on mine. And she's like, okay, but we built it together. I use a lot of we terminology 
in my language, even with my kids, because we is nurturing parent. However, it's only nurturing parent. If you actually have someone's best interest in mind, it's manipulative when you have your own best interest in mind. Uh, it's like that radical candor piece of manipulative insincerity. Uh, it, yeah. it feels that same way. That's where the resistance comes in. I will not be taken advantage of. That's actually critical parent. Critical parent avoids being taken advantage of the exact same thing prospects do when they think they're being manipulated in a sales call, they get really critical and they shut it down because Mm -hmm. they're aware of what that person's doing because it's very transparent. So I think that makes a lot of sense. So how do we get from, you know, from you entering into critical parent and then them going into a rebellious child, even if they don't say anything, if they don't articulate that they're rebelling, their behavior will rebel and they won't come along with you to get to the best solution. They'll just shut down internally. It may be like a, mm-hmm, yeah, totally. And inside they're like, no fucking way. There's no way in hell I'm going to do that. There. I'm going to tell you, yeah, but I hate you. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I would say, how do you take the nurturing parent approach. I appreciate you dedicating time to thinking about a solution for this. That shows me that you're vested and that you care. Would you be willing to sit down and hash out some of these ideas so that we can meet in the middle on what the best end result for the client really is? I am absolutely willing to dedicate that time if you are, right? That's what I would do if that were my kid. And my kid would be like, okay, yeah, that seems fair <laughs> because I want them to go into adaptive child. I don't want to, I, I, if I'm that other person, I don't want to say no and be a rebellious child. That seems weird and out of place. So that's strange. So I should definitely jump on board with this invitation to explore things differently. Mm-hmm. So as you go through your week, I know we've, we've only got, uh, we're wrapping up here, but as you go through your week, being cognizant of how do I stay in nurturing parent or adult and stay out of every other ego state just in your transactions with people. And we can talk about the ones that trigger you most to go into critical parent, because I think it's helpful to have really um, good awareness into that because it's a trap that we all fall into. Um, When someone tells me that they think I'm wrong is a great time for me to be like, (laughs) actually, and I can go into little professor and shred someone, right? And because it feels good to me. And then I'm like, I'm the smartest person in the room. I don't have any friends. But I'm smart, right? <laughs> I don't want to do that. That's not productive for me. I have to know that that's a trigger for me to fall into, probably from having three critical parents that, that I had to continuously and constantly prove myself to all the time. I'm sure that's what that history is, right? But I, but it's no long. I can't use that as an excuse in my actual adult life. I can't just be like, well, it's my parents' fault. I'm 36 years old and they fuck me up. And there's nothing I can do. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have to take responsibility for how I am now, even if that hardwiring came from something that was handed to me. I have to make the best of it. So understand personal triggers are that send you into rebellious child, critical parent, little professor, those things that are really unproductive in, in facilitating connection and moving things forward and actually having easy interaction. That's what this is about. Even if you're not selling and influencing or whatever, how do I just make my conversations less stressful? And I don't, I don't want to walk away from conversations like, Ugh, and then think about it for the next 12 hours and think about all my comebacks in the shower and stuff. Like I, that's not how I want to live my life. It's coming from a place of peace. And how do I instill peace through these transactions? So do y'all feel vulnerable enough to be able to share what your personal triggers are that send you into some of these ego states? I promise they're probably all the same. You're not going to have a weird one. It's not like people compliment me and I want to punch them in the face. That's not what you're going to say. <laughs> they're all going to be really normal. <laughs> I quite, when people compliment me, sometimes I think it's um, not genuine that they're kind of on the sly making fun of me. Mm, interesting. Is it everyone? If I were to compliment you, would you feel that way? No. So who are the people that do compliment you that make you feel that way? The people I don't trust. (laughs) (laughs) And the people who I think, now that I think about it, ooh, I've got some faces. Um, The people who I think are not really interested in my best interest 
but they want to be close enough so they're still in the mix. Yes. So they are coming from their child ego state of little professor, and they are pinging your critical parent. So it's easier for me sometimes in my, to, to take it down to my adult. I can't always get to my nurturing parent. Sometimes I just have to get to my adult. And it's the fact of saying, I appreciate you saying that and walking away, right? It's just the, the logic to logic, adult to adult. I'm not going to say, oh my gosh, thank you. That means so much to me. You're such a good person. You're such a great friend, right? And go into adaptive child. because That's not true. And that's not how I feel. Um, so I just got to cut it at adult. Similarly, transactions happen like you to you internally all the time. What does your internal voice sound like? Is it critical parent? Because I got a theory on that. When you criticize yourself and you go into critical parent and then you're like, why won't my behavior change? Why can I never change anything? I don't know. Could you be responding with your rebellious child transaction on the other side? Mm -hmm. <laughs> critical parents like, you're so stupid. And rebellious child's like, I'll show you stupid. You want to see stupid? I'm going to go burn down that house across. The street. <laughs> and you're like, why am I in this self-sabotage? Oh, oh, oh. I don't know. <laughs> so when we talk about parenting ourselves, that's a real thing. It's actually your ego state. Um, Becky, what are, what are your, oh, you gave us a trigger. Denisa, what's your, what's your trigger to get, send you into a non-productive ego state? I think I, as you sit here and say this, I think about work. <laughs> oh yeah. That's the biggest thing. Plenty of those examples. And I just, you know, from, are you stupid to, because sometimes you're just baffled by how people respond. And even my associates right now in this virtual environment is just maddening to me uh, as to how they respond or don't respond. And you know, I can go from, oh my God, I just want to choke somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's where I am, you know, a lot of the time with just some of the same repetitive pushback. Yep. Yep. Um, have that internally as well. And as I told you, my favorite behavioral style or, or transactional state is rebellious child. I'd love to just live there. I'd be so good at it if I could just live there. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't would, be hard. I, no, I would have so much more energy because I exert so much energy trying to be nurturing all the time. I'm tired all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Less <But> exhausting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just maybe wouldn't have a job or friends or family. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, so I, I have similar things like that in, in my building. And I constantly have to say, tell me why you feel that way. Help me understand. What is the resistance that you're feeling right now? I really, I, we talked about this morning in a, in a training I was doing about empathy training. Like, I don't know what the, what the official empathy training is. I can only tell you what I do to increase my own empathy in moments where I don't want to have it. My empathy scale is actually, it's been assessed and it's a nine out of 10, like danger, Will Robinson, too much empathy. I can't handle to y'all. I get if three people clap at, at, at a time, I'm crying because I moved. <laughs> oh, oh, anyway. Um, but in moments where I'm mad because of my behavioral style, because I'm a very high D empathy drops and I, I, it's very hard for me to access. So my own empathy training is when people piss me off, I have to actually picture them as their little kid self with their fear written across their shirt and then ask myself, really, are you going to shred this person that's standing in front of you, hiding this child inside of a giant meat suit, asking you for help? Is that, is that the kind of person you want to be? I was like, no, <laughs> God, fine. Um, and so I, I'd love to hear your empathy hacks as well, but that's my number one. And I just got to, sometimes I got to be careful not to be too patronizing and put them in like a little cowboy hat and a sheriff badge or because <laughs> 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 then I'll talk to them in my patronizing voice, but it helps me to, to actually picture them coming from their childlike state and, mm -hmm. and asking myself, how would I facilitate this with a child? Should you have to? No. Are you better trained in communication and understanding people than there? Yeah. 
for sure. And so yeah. with great power comes great responsibilities. So unfortunately, it is always going to rest on your shoulders, but that's why y'all sign up for shit like this. Cause you already know that. <laughs> <laughs> so might as well go for it and just make it easier. <laughs> so true. So true. Um, Okay. None of this is really that. I just wanted to get to this side. So give me something that you, you got out of your last 35, 45 minutes, um, that you can take with you moving forward through the week. I love how you shared picturing them that way. Cause I guess I've never thought of it in that. I I've thought of them as big. Cause I probably in the last two weeks, I've talked to my team about professional maturity mm-hmm. or professional Maturity. So it's kind of in the same vein, but in my head, picturing it that way would probably be more helpful for me because I know me and I've, I've been told I'm a D too. So yeah, I get it. <laughs> so I yeah. get it. And I, I changed a little bit from my former organization where I was an extreme high D. I kind of shifted a little bit where I am now because I learned I needed to figure out how to maneuver differently. Mm -hmm. And probably I was a high D Rebecca from how I was treated at that organization. I was going to say high D was a survival mechanism. You're, you're much more more Uh, DI now. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Because if I was outsider and didn't belong, so I was just fighting all the time. Yep, that'll do it. Guess yeah. what? Rebellious child. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, who else? Great. Um, I probably come from more of the nurturing side instinctively because I'm more of an IS. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like right here. Mm-hmm. So. I feel like I'm more nurturing. So when the rebellious side of me comes out, it's usually, it usually takes a lot to trigger that. Yeah. Usually commonly the same people. Mm -hmm. And what I struggle more with is regaining that trust in those people and then treating them like I treat everyone else because I can't go backwards then. It's like my, my, my mind's already made up about those people when in reality, I don't think that I know that's probably not fair because so I've, I've never figured out how to like get into their ego. Like that's, you know, like you said, the, the, um, little professor, like I never looked at it that way before. Yeah. I think it is fair. Right. Um, it's, it's, that's their choice. That was their choice to institute that behavior. Um, there are consequences for your actions. You learn that when you're a child too. Um, but I wonder if it would be helpful for you if you, if you, released the responsibility of building that trust again. And instead just accepting, I don't have to trust them. I actually only have to trust myself that no matter what situation they put me in, I will be able to handle it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that drops that defense attacky sort of mode. You can sort of vacillate in between when you don't trust someone is if you can trust yourself implicitly to handle mm-hmm. the situation, no matter what they throw at you. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah. That's, that that's really helpful. Emily's helped me with that when I go home to visit my parents, where my mom is a big trigger for me. And she'll say, well, on your drive there, just say to yourself, who do you want to be no matter what happens around you in that visit? And, and then I couple that with Eliza's teaching that when I am feeling triggered, the emotion of being triggered, I just say to myself, I'm okay. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Right. So I can and I think, I think those feelings of doubt slip in sometimes when those people trigger me, like, I, I know exactly who I'm thinking of right now. When they trigger me, then I instantly have, well, the rebellious side, but then feelings of not, did I not do something I was supposed to do? Should I have done this better? Should I have done, like, I start questioning my ability to do my job, which I think is so dumb. Like, I know I'm saying it's dumb, but I a like, child. I don't want to be left. Yeah. Yep. I don't want to be left out. I don't want there to be conversations where the conversation is, do we get rid of Becky? Like that's the, don't leave me right. Not necessarily the jerks with the influence the jerks may have, if that's a bad sure. chatter happening, right. That's, that's your adaptive child going, Oh no. 
Um, yeah. Yep. And just, you know, I think anybody's adaptive health can get triggered anytime. So what's helpful for me sometimes too, is saying, oh, hey, adaptive child, appreciate you. Yep. You're a part of me, but I'm going to remove that choice for you. I'm going to go ahead and mm-hmm. go adult to adult here in this internal transaction. And thanks for showing up. That's not the reality. Goodbye now. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I eradicate choice for myself all the time. When my children, when my little children ego states show up, my easiest one to access, I'm not great at, at doing the, like, you're okay. Or you're safe or like, you're a special star snowflake. I'm not, I'm not good at nurturing myself. I think it's just because I didn't never have that experience, but mm-hmm. I'm really good at eliminating the choice and saying there is no choice. There is no try. There is only do, there is no fear. There is only right. This path that you've chosen. And there is, and, and just taking one, (laughs) that's easier for me. Sure. Rebecca, do you want to share one or are we? I'm just laughing to myself because I didn't know this stuff until after I started using the metaphor of the little bitch in her head, but it's the same concept simplified, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's our natural, our brains are literally wired for this stuff and we know it intuitively, even then when you taught this and I was like, oh, that was intuitive to me to feel that way. We have all this. Mm-hmm. We just need to trust ourselves to use it. Yeah. Yeah. And to remember everyone sitting across from you also has it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's really essential um, in, in making transactions with people easier is mm-hmm. it's a lot to think about. You got to think about this. You got to think about critical parent, nurturing parent adult. You got to think about, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but you're smart. You'll figure it out. Maybe step. <laughs> I think it, it always helps if you, because like you said, you've got one person in your mind that you immediately think about that example, right? I always find yeah. that it's easier for me to learn concepts like this. If I pick one scenario, one person, one relationship, one transaction, pick something and really be intentional in that situation. And then the growth start to apply at other areas. Because if I try to do it with all my transactions or all my interactions, sure. I get paralyzed. But just take that yeah. one thing or one person and go, okay, let me think this through before I talk to them or when I'm responding to them. That's a really good thought because right now my rebellious child just wants to say, fuck you. And then I'm like, <laughs> and I always realize, like, I just don't like, I'm over it. And I know that's not like, I don't treat anyone else like that. <laughs> so I am like, I know that's not appropriate. Well, like, it's I also like, giving that person the power. If you step into a childlike state, you've yeah. handed them the parent role. That's true. Mm-mm, no, thanks. Yeah that makes me even that actually pisses me off even more (laughs) right (laughs) to think that they could be like they're controlling over me that really is annoying yeah great now you can let it go yeah right (laughs) (laughs) good that's all i had Yay. yay I think there was something I was going to ask you guys or remind you guys of that I thought of this morning. Is our next uh, class Monday with you? It's one of those ones that falls closer together. Yep, three o'clock. What do you want to talk about? I'll miss. Oh, well, it's recorded. What do you want to talk about? I'm going to stop. What do you want to talk about next week?